Moving from the eternal optimist to the career pessimist. <laughs> you have to tell you about everything that can go wrong on the planet. Uh, yeah, no, cool. Thanks, folks. And um, I want to talk to you today about uh, something that I guess everybody in the AI space has been talking about. And we'll also define everybody in just a bit. Uh, but it is the California AI Safety Bill. Um, as it stands today, as of day of recording, the bill has been passed by the legislature and is awaiting final confirmation by the governor, which is expected, the last date of which is September 30th. So uh, by September 30th, uh, Governor Newsom, who is a Democratic uh, candidate, or sorry, not candidate, govern Democratic governor of California, will either confirm or reject the bill. And that's when it comes into law. Um, that when now when we say everybody has been talking about it, it's basically everybody in California, which uh, for all practical purposes is most of the large companies and all the big tech companies that are impacting or creating the AI space today. Um, when this bill came out, uh, there was you know a furore of activity and uh, lots of most of the usual suspects in the big tech space have actually come out very vocally against it and that includes all of the like the googles open ais of the world um and then on the other side there have been some groups and some individuals who have actually come out in support of the bill uh, like professor hinton uh, has come out in support of the bill uh, there have been uh, women's uh, rights advocacy groups that have come out in support of the bill and we'll get into like the what's and why's later interestingly anthropic uh, has come out with uh, with suggestions with uh, criticisms of the bill which were then later incorporated there were amendments and an amended version was released and then anthropic was like kind of midway territory and not taking either extreme now what is this damn bill and why should we care great questions okay so i'm going to quickly talk about some of like the major features of of the entire thing and what it's trying to do so as the name suggests uh, at least the the ai safety bill is of course not its official title the official title is um Senate Bill 1047, Safe and Secure Innovation for Frontier Artificial Intelligence Models Act. I admittedly, that's why we call it the AI Safety Bill. Very easy to remember. Because, very easy to remember. Uh, so it's called the AI Safety Bill. Uh, now, what uh, it tries to address, so a couple of things, right? First, number one, who does it address? It addresses what they're calling as frontier AI systems. And what is a frontier AI system as per the bill? It is if it costs a hundred million dollars to train it, slash is greater than a ten to the power twenty six flops, a computing power. And second criteria is that, and this is part of what got amended, the cost of fine tuning the model is greater than ten million dollars, equal to or greater than ten million dollars. So uh, interestingly, one of the first pieces of legislation that have contemplated fine tuning as also a component to be considered as opposed to in just creating models, right? So those are the two uh, entities that would be governed under this. Uh, now, what are the, what does it seek to achieve? Number one, it puts in a bunch of uh, safety and security protocols. So it talks about how there are certain protocols to be implemented. There are certain audits that the system needs to put itself through at an annual basis. They even talk about who will set out the governing systems of audit. Uh, and then they talk about, uh, you know, the kind of safety protections they have to have in place. Uh, now, one of the kind of evaluations of this is that most large organizations are already have this in place, that this is an additional uh, piece of burden that you're going to be uh, kicking in, which is not, may not be the industry norms, very subjective in nature. But let's say, as a baseline implementing certain safety and security protocol, there is a certain sense of appreciation of that aspect across the board. Uh, but another piece which it does kick in is that it suggests that there should be a kill switch for systems if there is perceived to be critical harm. Now, this is the fun bit. 
uh, where I really want to share the definition of critical harm. And then I want to have a long conversation with you folks about it. Uh, but one second, here we go. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? I know this looks like gobbledygook, yes. uh, but I will just highlight what it is that we want to cover. Uh, so critical harm, oh, this is what it does not include. Yeah, there. critical harm means any of the following harms that can be caused or materially enabled by a covered model. Covered model is models that are created by any of the frontier AI systems. Number one, creation or use of a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapon in a manner that causes mass casualties. Number two, casualties resulting in $500 million of damage resulting from cyber attacks on critical infrastructure or precise instructions for conducting cyber attack. C, casualties or at least $500 million of damage resulting from an AI model engaging in conduct that does both of the following, acts with limited human oversight, results in death, great bodily injury, property damage, property loss, and constitute a crime. Okay, just take a second, process that, because this is very close to like Lex Luthor territory, at which point my argument is the ship has sailed, send the people to jail and carry on. Uh, but that's part of what is being contemplated as uh, what, the point where a kill switch needs to be incorporated, or at least have the ability to uh, kind of shut it down with a simple view. Uh, I will get back to this in just a minute, but I'm going to take a pause with that. Uh, another major feature that the AI safety bill does talk about, and understandably, this is one of the more contentious ones. It puts on substantial individual liability or like liability on developers and says the developers are liable for if their models have this impact. Now, one of the unintentional downstream impacts of this, which is where a lot of folks have come up, up in arms, is that this will impact open source. This will impact foundational models, arguably, because the argument is that even when it starts impacting people who are fine tuning models or having second order effects and adopt it and then start working on it, if there is a critical harm caused by somebody else who has used your open source model, potentially you could be liable as well, which obviously tries to, I mean, uh, in fact, potentially takes a lot of the AI advancements in the opposite direction. Uh, it disincentivizes any large tech organization from open sourcing AI, which has really led to the revolution that we're currently enjoying. So that is a major issue. Uh, and then the last major uh, item is that it provides a bunch of whistleblower protections. Uh, there has been criticism that the whistleblower protections it provides can potentially be abused. And so some of that is also not fun. It's kind of like overtly encouraging whistleblowers. Um, so that's where they've been a little upset about it, but that's one of the fields. Uh, I will take a pause here. There is a lot to unpack. But I will take a pause if there are any questions, queries, then we'll jump right in. Just one comment. I think developers will take the front of all of this. Who are developers? <laughs> This is the point. So it doesn't even talk about like, it doesn't clearly identify organizations or things like that. It talks about developers and yeah. we need to kind of unpack a little bit about what does it mean developer organizations? Like obviously individuals cannot be held liable. It has to be a Google or something. And I'm sure IP law will take care of that. But yeah, it doesn't, it kind of kills the spirit of how like an open AI or like just all model development work and everything has been happening right now. So that's one day you're just you are, sorry. You are assuming that the developers have the, the developer or the research scientist has built that model. It could also be the case maybe AI has a built a model. So uh, uh, this is where uh, this yeah. we're definitely going to get into mad cow disease territory, right? Where it's like who has created the model? What level of it is actually created by a developer? Um, how much of it is organic, who needs to be held responsible and how can you even, so I have to say, so one of the amendments that they have incorporated was that they have narrowed pre-harm enforcement because earlier they had, they have narrowed it, not eliminated it. Earlier there was a larger purview of uh, 
free harm enforcement that could be anticipated. And that's like minority reports, right? Where we're saying that this potentially could mess up and then we have a bunch of liability. Uh, but that has been narrowed, but not completely eliminated. So that's also going to be something to kind of watch out for amongst other things. So one day you're just like coding and fixing bugs and the next day you're like, uh, you're yeah. not accused of making like a, a weapon of mass destruction or something, right? Because I used your model for the creation or use of a chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear weapon. That is insane. Um, yeah, so poor developers. Yeah, totally. T- <laughs> so so home is just like, leave my people oh, alone. Yeah. <laughs> so, so super interesting, correct? I think it does look like a, more of a conservative side kind of an argument to safeguard the uh, the kind of you know, impact yeah. of a model could have i think uh, so so that's kind of pretty evident from the yeah. from the bill itself uh, but that's also how a usual uh, technology or even any breakthroughs like you know there's a lot of resistance towards that adoption correct? Yeah. and that's a we have seen in the past as well uh, so i'm not surprised in terms of like you know the kind of uh, make, safeguards that a particular bill employs out of it. Uh, but it would be interesting to kind of you know, see how some of this can be enforced. Correct. So yes. that's that's another uh, way of one is having those kind of you no know, safeguard mechanism. The second is that how do you monitor that? How do you implement that in a, in a, in a, in a yeah. things out of it? And the third yeah. one is that once you detect that, what are the things you kind of you know, do that? I mean, Correct. We have seen similar things with data privacy laws and some of the other things out there. Yes. Uh, while it does have, I mean, you you might have seen some organization might have uh, kind of you know, got caught into that particular framework. Maybe there were penalties. There were kind of you know, a bunch of other repercussions out of it. But I have never seen uh, a developer or maybe a small organization yeah. kind of getting into that, uh, that yeah. things out of it. Uh, yeah. So it would be interesting. So again, uh, so I'm I'm kind of you now on the fence with the bill. Honestly, it's it's both encouraging on some point of view. Yeah. It's also kind of you no know, discouraging uh, kind of you no know, innovation on. So I, I'm kind of you no know, on with you. So home on, on both things out there. Uh, yeah. But as like anything, let's wait to see how kind of you no know, this gets rolled out. The what second thing happened? is that it would be also interesting to see how policymakers keep monitoring this. Yeah. Correct. Like it's is it just a ink on the paper or there's a next iteration coming in? There's like yeah. two things. Yeah. And it's no, impact on the global. Uh, uh, yes. Things. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. You were saying something. No, no, no. One one hundred percent with you on each of that, right? And I'm going to I'm going to do something. I'm going to play like turncoat on this because a lot of the people who've had like who've been very vocal about this, understandably, have been. Like the big techs who are already in this and investors and basically, obviously, with people with a lot of skin in the game. Uh, I'm going to take the advantage of being nowhere close to California uh, to kind of give my take kind of both sides of the argument, right? So I think one thing is absolutely to your point, Dushant. I think in terms of a new technology, trying to, uh, you know, figure it out. If nothing else, kind of just saying, can we just start talking about this in a way that starts making sense to us? And that's where, let's say, uh, some of the arguments for the people supporting the bill came from, Um, which is that for better or for worse, there is this kind of awe-inspiring fear or perception of AI today, right? Where there is a thing of, oh, this could go way beyond our understanding. And so some of the women's rights groups who were in support of the bill, their entire perception is this is going to, let's say, with deep fakes and things like that, there is going to be a disproportionate impact on minority groups and vulnerable groups such as women. And so we are in support of this bill, which is completely fair. Um, but on the other hand, apart from, let's say, critical harm, the bill does not really get into detailing other kinds of harm. And really, what are you looking to prevent? Uh, to my mind, on the spectrum of what harm is, what they've laid out as critical harm, it's like comically insane. This is like 
Pinky and the Brain has conceptualized this. Um, in fact, I think that somebody had this has triggered from some urban legend where somebody had actually tried getting Chat GPT or something to generate a radiological uh, chemical or radiological weapon, and it was just it like just added like strong existing identified radiological material as an ingredient and everything, and said, "Yeah, this is going to, yes, it's going to be harmful." So, I think understanding where to my mind this bill has completely missed the point uh, amongst others is that it seems to not know what it's trying to protect people from this definition of critical harm is is an extreme if we have reached that point then i assure you a crim uh, like a slap on the hand from the act or from the government is the least of your problems the the genie is out of the bottle I appreciating and understanding the more rudimentary impacts of actual AI harm, such as when AI is invoked into decision making, when AI generated content is indistinguishable from other content. None of that is really identifiable because that is really the everyday stuff which people are going to be impacted by. This seems to be targeted towards, in their minds, only large tech organizations, which also the monetary thresholds are laughably minimal. Um, and they seem to be targeted at like these very extreme perspectives but not talking about like the more normal ways in which we are possibly going to be harmed by ai before we get to that uh and in all of that saying you're going to pin liability on an unsuspecting developer who did not have the intent of creating such a model is is like just finding you know a scapegoat and being like okay you're it um so yeah in my summary is as follows the people while there are several folks who are on the same page as to the intent of what the bill is trying to do um the supporters are glad to see some action the defectors or the people against it the detractors are along the lines of yes liability is is definitely misplaced this is not uh, and also one very clear point that the critics have laid out is that harm, what harms of AI are not very different from, let's say, harms that exist today. AI will possibly scale it up, but not really create a new harm. And that's some of the critics have. Um, my opinion, being far away from all of this, uh, is that it's actually not doing enough. Is that if you really want an AI safety bill, this seems performative, um, and it's very you know targeted at like money bags without really doing anything. Uh, which brings me to actually the last point that I wanted to cover on this. Uh, sitting in India, should we care? Right? Is this of relevance to us? Is this of importance to us? Uh, and the answer is kind of twofold. Uh, one. The bill is not very clear with regards to its applicability. So, for example, some interpretations see it as like a GDPR situation, wherein if the if it impacts Californian citizens, you could be the the law could be invoked. In which case, if you are building a model that is deployed in California or impacts Californian citizens, you sh you may have to care about this. Um, but then I think the second point is what Dushin said, which is what could this mean? for everybody else who's trying to create AI legislation, what do they take from this and how do they incorporate it? Um, I think it's just a very, very interesting case study to see how people are reacting to it, what the concerns, what are the problem statements um, and how it definitely impacts innovation and the next set of people who are going to be creating it. So yeah, that was that's my kick of the day of looking at this crazy bill. Uh, yeah, I'll take a pause here. So one more thing, right? Like if you're yeah. talking about models, right? Like there's mm -hmm. so many other things like social media or search engines, right? Like yeah. all the things that you talked about could be done by those as well, right? You could get yes. information from social media or yeah. through a search, right? And yeah. That's probably happening, right? Like what does it mean for exactly. things that are not covered, right? It's not a model, but something yeah. that you find on somewhere right what does it mean no no actually you're spot on so to be fair it does call out that 
the critical harm definition does not include where the derivative outputs of the information is otherwise publicly accessible today. Um, or it did, you know, the model did not materially contribute to the software's ability to cause or enable the harm. So, and then not caused by the, so 100%, you are absolutely right that if it is something that's already done today, should this cover it? Uh, and the answer is no, it does not. Like that's not impacted. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing or just a logical loophole in this entire thing? I don't know. Uh, because obviously, absolutely to your point, that exposes the intention of the bill, right? You're looking for somebody to blame. You're not looking to address the actual harm. You're not saying that this is a problem and we will figure out that this problem is to be put back in the bottle. You're saying this seems to be offending material. If you saw it, otherwise it's cool. But if it's seen through an AI system, then do something about it, which you kind of need to figure out what they're trying to do and what they're trying to address. Um, so yeah, I am, uh, but I, I get where people are up in arms and I definitely get why it's generated so much conversation. Um, but I think it's going to fall logically on its face very soon. Uh, yeah. So, so, so just to kind of you know, say, correct, what it is hoping that when people are building models or building applications, they want to look at broader intent of that. Yeah. And kind of maybe assume, okay, this could potentially could go wrong and have a safeguard into it. However, yeah. as, as Saranya mentioned that the AI safety bill is not intelligent. It's artificial. It's not intelligent enough. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, no one knows about like, you know, what could kind of know, could go wrong out of it. I think that's where the large companies yeah. are also a bit of uncomfortable that okay yeah i'm training a foundation model on vast yeah. generalized heterogeneous data so let's say and then the specific task is being done by the end uh, correct user out of it now there could be thousand of those use cases correct and yeah. that one use case you can't be holding accountable for things out of it so. Exactly. In fact, when I was uh, listening to this podcast, which was talking about, you know, like, and, and uh, it's the, the, the RT and Ram show, they had an episode on this. And we, they were discussing the very same point where, especially with regards to the threshold, threshold seems to cover, let's say, you know, large language models or systems like that, which are covering this impressive computing power threshold of 10 to raise power 26. But the argument is also being made is, that actually the large language models have possibly, uh, like I think the phrase used was it's smoothed out. It has a, it's averaged out to a large extent. It is not trying to specifically solve a problem. So the first assumption we're making is that the large language model can have a larger dangerous impact than a smaller model, which is built to specifically reach a particular objective. So let's say if you have built a, spe a smaller model, but with a very specific intent to create a certain kind of harm, uh, that could potentially go under the radar. And it's the large language model, which does not have the capacity to ha to create such a sharp harm, which will come under this act. The first assumption they're making is that the large, more generalized content is more harmful or can potentially cause more harm than anything else. And I think that assumption itself, they were the argument was, is, is false. Yeah, so I think in, in the context window, so the bigger the context window, Correct. Yes. You know, you're trying to kind of know more generalize out of it. Uh, and because the larger context window, the all the other thing you mentioned, the 10 to the power 26 flops and like, you know, yeah. the, the amount of infrastructure required to train is, is, is that's where they're safeguarding it. Versus yeah. on the other side, if you look at the more specific model, which is trained for a specific task. So you need to have that data for, to kind of know, be able to do that. Uh, but it lacks that uh, that kind of you know, riding on giant shoulder kind of it. Let's say like you right. know things out of it. So uh, it kind of in there principally it, it kind of you know, becomes uh, still challenging to get to a model with that accuracy on a, on a small thing. But again, as I said, these are all this is 
artificially not intelligent <laughs> yeah uh, a kind of no way of looking into it but super nice then and i'm very happy that you you dig into it you kind of to put the things out very it, it kind of to makes no, me no. go back and read more about it and also kind of to watch arki and sriram's show to kind of to learn yes. more about it thank you thank you no Michelle. it was yeah and, no no it was really interesting i'd love to kind of um maybe we'll add a link uh to the podcast as well for people to check it out and I, i love serena how you go through the things that we probably just always scroll and accept or something but you're actually going through all these you know details and understanding the context which is something i've this learned to why, appreciate you plus one, one, plus plus one, one, one person is excited question. about reading it sorry plus one to what so i'm saying i have a trivia question now oh no how many end user license agreement do you read <laughs> <laughs> you know what nobody does even like i would none of the lawyers read that it's because it's intended to obfuscate um so yeah 100% but bills are more exciting uh, so do check it out so you so you go through each and every which is fantastic thank you yeah no no thank you